Warning, massive spoilers for all of the Dance of the Dragons section of Fire and Blood, and by extension probably all of House of the Dragon. Do not watch this video if you don't want those things spoiled. I guarantee you it's not worth it. You gone? Right. It is many years since the Conqueror invaded and united the kingdom under his yoke. After his death, his sons fought one another for the throne, but that problem of too many heirs seems to the current king like a luxury, for the realm now finds it has none. The king did have a son, in whom all the realm's hopes had been invested, but he is now dead. The king still has a brother, but one with whom he has quarrelled and fought with over the years, and is not seen by anyone as a worthy successor. But the king has one other option, his daughter. But a woman has never ruled this young kingdom before. The king is unsure of whether the realm will accept his daughter, so he gathers all his lords together and demands that they swear oaths to uphold her right to the throne. Years pass. The daughter's husband dies and she remarries, bearing multiple sons who may rule after her. Yet when the king does eventually die, his daughter is away from the kingdom, and pregnant with her third child by her second husband. Before she can return, another family member, one who is among those who has sworn an oath to uphold her, seizes the crown. What follows is at first a period of uncertainty, of attempts to avoid a conflict, but these end quickly. A bloody civil war breaks out, remembered as terrible even by the standards of the time. Though the princess seizes the capital and briefly is in the ascendancy, the populace do not love her, and she is quickly forced to flee. As such, she will never be recognised by history as an official queen of the realm. After years of fighting, the land is weary of war. With the usurper's heir dead, an agreement is reached. The usurper will continue to reign, but the princess's eldest son will rule after him. The usurper is dead within a year, and the princess's son takes the throne. You saw the title of this video, you know what I'm going to say next. My description there could apply to the fictional Dance of the Dragons, as portrayed in Fire and Blood and House of the Dragon. But it also applies to a real-life historical conflict, one fought between 1135 and 1154 in England and Normandy, known to us today as the Anarchy. This isn't a theory video, Gurm has explicitly said that he was inspired by the Anarchy when writing the dance. Instead, this video will just be having a look at the similarities between the history and the fiction. And of course, when the narrative tracks this closely to actual events, it's also interesting to see what changes have been made, because that tells us a little bit about the story the author wants to tell. And before we begin, I remind you that I am not a historian, and my knowledge of this period of history comes from one book I read two years ago, a bunch of podcasts I listened to to refresh my memory, and of course, the font of all knowledge, Wikipedia. So if I get something wrong, tell me in the comments. The historical story starts in 1120 in England. The king is Henry I, who has ruled since the suspicious death of his brother William II in 1100. Henry I has a son named William, who history remembers as William Etheling. Ethling basically just means heir to the throne. William is 17 when he drowns along with a bunch of other young members of the nobility in the White Ship Tragedy, leaving Henry I without a legitimate son, though he did have a lot of illegitimate ones and holds the record for most illegitimate children had by an English king at 23. Anyway, Henry I is aged around 52 at this time, so remarrying and fathering another heir who will be old enough to rule when Henry dies is a bit of a long shot, but Henry goes for it anyway marrying Adeliza of Louvain in 1121. Henry does have other options. This is older brother Robert Curthose. Curthose means short stockings or short boot, by the way, which I love, and also means it's kind of like calling him Robert Caligula. The trouble with Robert Curthose is that he's been in prison since 1106 after rebelling against Henry in 1101. He'll stay in prison until his death in 1134, aged around 83. So that gives you an idea of how he wasn't exactly a top candidate to be Henry's chosen heir. Like Viserys and Daemon, the relationship between Henry and Robert Curthose wasn't always antagonistic, but also like Viserys and Daemon, Henry didn't want Robert on the throne. He did have nephews though, Robert's son William Cleto, favoured by the French, and Henry's sister Adela's sons, Theobald and Stephen. He also had many bastard sons, foremost among them probably the eldest and definitely the most powerful Robert of Gloucester, but as in Westeros, bastards inheriting was frowned upon in medieval England. The dynamic shifted when his daughter's first husband, Emperor Henry V of the Holy Roman Empire, died. Like Lenor Valerian and Venera, the Emperor never gave Matilda any heirs, though the real Queen didn't have any suspicious-looking bastards to worry about. Henry recalled Matilda to England in 1126 and declared her the heir, 
gathering in the barons from across the realm to swear oaths to recognise her and her possible future children. Henry was a bit smarter than Viserys, and so kept calling the barons back to reaffirm their oaths in 1128 and 1131, though in the end it did Matilda no more good than it did Rhaenyra. The strange relationship between Viserys and Daemon has another parallel in the disagreements between Henry and Matilda's second husband, Joffrey of Anjou. The heir and her husband wanted to be given great control of Normandy, which at the time was still controlled by the kings of England, so as to have a power base in case of trouble with the succession, a bit like how Daemon wanted to be named Prince of Dragonstone. Anyway, the parallels really come into focus when Henry I dies in 1135 while Matilda is away in Normandy, pregnant with her third child by her second husband. Though unlike Rhaenyra's kid, this child, William, will live to the ripe old age of 27, and be burdened by history of the two equally horrendous nicknames William Fitz Empress and William Longspee. He's completely irrelevant to our story, I just wanted an excuse to say Longspee. While Matilda was in Normandy, weirdly helping a rebellion against the now dead Henry I, because she and her husband Geoffrey were annoyed at not being given those castles, her cousin and Henry's nephew, Stephen of Blois, which I'm told isn't pronounced Blois because the French are no fun, quickly seizes the crown, despite having sworn an oath to uphold Matilda in 1127 along with the other nobles. Stephen had a head start on the other claimants. Although he was also in Normandy, he was in Boulogne, which is on the northern coast, whereas Geoffrey and Matilda were in Anjou, and Theobald was in Blois. Just like Aegon, Stephen was cheered by the crowds in London when he made it there a couple of weeks after Henry's death, and like Aegon, he had the backing of the church, helped in no small part by the fact that his younger brother Henry was Bishop of Winchester, one of the most powerful bishoprics at the time. There was even a rumour put out that Henry I had declared Stephen his heir on his deathbed, like happens in the TV show, and it was alleged that Matilda was illegitimate because her mum had been a nun, which has echoes of the bastardy allegations against Rhaenyra's kids. One major difference between the anarchy and the Dance of the Dragons is... Timing. You could fit two Dances of the Dragons into the space it took for the anarchy to properly kick off, which it only really did in 1139 when Matilda invaded. But that changes probably for pacing purposes. 19 years of sieges do not a good story make. And that's what most of the anarchy is, 19 years of sieges. It starts with Matilda landing in Sussex and taking the castle of Arundel, where her stepmother Adeliza is. Stephen lays siege, but, get this, lets her go because it's a chivalric thing to do. It may seem hard to believe, but Stephen allowed Matilda to go to a much better defended castle in Bristol, which would be her main seat of operations in England for the rest of the war, because laying siege to a castle commanded by a woman was just not the done thing. You could make a case that it's a calculating move based on societal pressures, attacking a woman would hurt Stephen's reputation with the nobles and so on, and there probably is a bit of that, but many historians view it as genuine. So there's a massive difference between the real history and the dance. All the exciting anarchy stuff happens in 1141, in a series of events that bears some similarities to the dance. First, Stephen is captured at the Battle of Lincoln in February, which is reminiscent of Aegon being brutally injured early in the war and basically being out of the action for a while. Matilda then takes London, much like Rhaenyra took the capital of King's Landing. The two queens have equally brief periods in the ascendancy. Both are described by contemporaries as haughty, arrogant, jealous of their rights and so on, which for Matilda, real historians often attribute to the fact that she's a woman and people don't like her acting like a king. Also, our sources are mostly monks who weren't known for their progressive views. As I said, both Matilda and Rhaenyra don't last long in their respective capitals. Matilda went to Winchester where the clergy gathered before Easter to consider her claim, with Stephen's brother Henry, the Bishop of Winchester, promising to back Matilda if she granted him more control over the church in England. After Easter, the clergy proclaimed Matilda Lady of England and Normandy, then in June, Matilda went to London. She had a harder time with the capital even than Rhaenyra did, as the citizens of London, who had backed Stephen early on, were reluctant to support her, and quickly rose up and overthrew her on June 24th, forcing her to make a desperate escape and retreat to Oxford. Rhaenyra, for those of you who haven't read the book and ignored the spoiler warning, ruled in King's Landing for half a year before the small folk got sick of her and rioted, forcing her to flee. After fleeing the capital, both queens' fortunes took dramatic turns for the worse. Matilda's army was encircled at Winchester while besieging Henry of Blois, and her bastard half-brother Robert of Gloucester, her chief commander in England, was captured and lost so bad it's remembered as the Rout of Winchester. Matilda managed to escape yet again to Devizes, that's definitely not pronounced like that. Rhaenyra, on the other hand, didn't even fight another battle. She barely managed to make her way back from King's Landing to Dragonstone. The Anarchy had another 12 years to run yet, but like I said, it's mostly sieges. Stephen was released in 1142 in exchange for Robert of Gloucester, and the war was effectively reset. Matilda controlled the southwest, Stephen the southeast, and it stayed like that for about a decade. 
In 1153, negotiations to end the war were ongoing when Stephen's eldest son and heir presumptive Eustace died, just as Aegon's last son Maelor died, leaving him without an heir. This opened a door for Matilda's 20-year-old son Henry to be named as Stephen's heir, just as Rhaenyra's son Aegon was named as Aegon II's heir. Stephen and Aegon both died shortly after, allowing Henry II and Aegon III to take their respective thrones. Henry II spends some of his reign tearing down the castles that were the main weapon in the anarchy and had allowed it to drag on for so long. A bit like how Aegon III is known as the Dragon Bane, for presiding over the death of the dragons, which were the main instruments of the dance. There's other stuff I didn't get a chance to mention, like how Henry II wandered through England in 1149 up to Scotland to make an alliance with King David, a bit like Jace flying over to make an alliance with the Starks, though the North is usually paralleled with the North of England and Scotland is beyond the wall, though then again, David did at this time control possibly almost as far south as York. David didn't prove quite as useful as Krieg and Stark, though, their planned attack on York melting away as soon as Stephen showed up. So there you go, there's a lot of similarities between the two conflicts, which isn't that much of a surprise given that Germer said he drew inspiration from it. I also pointed out a couple of differences along the way, and of course there's a lot of surface level ones. The order of events, the number of sons, the lack of incest, and so on. But the most interesting one, I think, is the difference in the bitterness of the two conflicts. Before researching this, I thought that the big difference would be that Aegon II, for all his many, many faults, is still a more sympathetic character than Stephen who is remembered here in England, if he's remembered at all, as an absolutely awful king. Of course, Aegon is too, and I understand in the show he's pretty much exclusively evil. He's pretty bad in the book too, but there's a few indications that he might have just been a regular arsehole being manipulated by his family that he never actually wanted to be king, which is also, I'm told, a thing in the show. Stephen, on the other hand, seized the throne, and he wasn't even the king's son, he was the king's nephew, which shouldn't really matter, but it still feels worse. But now, rather than thinking the dance adds more complexity by making Aegon not as bad as Stephen, I think it probably makes him more evil. Stephen is generally described by historians as affable, well-liked, chivalrous, brave. Still not a very good king, and he did totally steal the throne from his cousin, but he's a more morally complex character than Aegon. For example, two years before Henry II went off on his jolly jaunt to Scotland, he tried to invade England at the age of 14, with 20 good men and not much else. The twenty good men were mercenaries, and when his pocket money to pay them dried up, he asked his mum for some cash, but she said no. So he asked his bastard uncle, Robert of Gloucester, but he said no. So he went and asked Stephen, who said yes, and paid them off, either because it was the right thing to do for your, uh, cousin once removed, possibly, or because he wanted to try and reconcile the family for a peace deal. Either way, not something Aegon II would have done. It's also worth mentioning that the anarchy didn't end with practically everyone dead and Henry coming to the throne because he was the last man standing, it ended with a peace agreement. A shaky one, sure, that might have fallen apart had Stephen lived longer, but still. Even the name the Anarchy is questioned by modern historians, who say that it wasn't actually that bad, and it kind of depended on where you lived. Supposedly the bits of Northern England controlled by King David were doing fine, possibly the only time in the history and future of the universe that the best place to live in England was Newcastle. All the sources we have, the ones that speak of Stephen's reign as 19 long winters, which, by the way, sounds a bit like a long night, and a time when Christ and his saints slept, were written by people on the front lines of the war, so it makes sense that the whole thing sounds as bad as it does. So in the end, the bitter hate fueled rivalry of the dance where everyone and their mum wants to kill everyone else and their mum, and their young children, and their aunt, and their pets, is quite different to the historical event that inspired it. Germers turned the interfamilial rivalry up to 11, or maybe historically it was only at like a 6. Why? I don't know, what is this, an English lit 40 marker? One answer is that violence and brutality is fun to write and read about. Another possibility is that it says something about how the cycle of violence will escalate as much as it possibly can, or whatever. Maybe if the anarchy had been fought aggressively with dragons rather than defensively with castles, it would have been a different story. Or maybe it's to make you, the reader, realise that when both sides of the war are so horrible, you shouldn't really be rooting for either, even though, as with every story about a two-sided conflict, you tend to instinctively pick a side, for most people, and me, Rhaenyra. Maybe by making the Greens so horribly evil, especially in the books where Alison isn't very sympathetic, so the most likeable Green you have is Daeron the Daring, who's barely in it, it makes you confront the difficulty that sometimes just because one side is evil doesn't mean the other side is good. Instead of affable but power-hungry Stephen and mildly uptight Matilda, we have kinslaying nonce Aegon and paranoid would-be kinslayer Rhaenyra, who is married to child murderer and also kinslaying nonce Daemon. In both wars, real and fictional, 
All the leading combatants are fighting selfishly for their own power and advancement. Why should we sympathise with any of them? And if we do, why should we care more about them than the thousands of ordinary people who died fighting their battles for them? With friend to all Stephen and rightful claimant Matilda, we might get caught up in cheering for one side or the other. With Aegon and Rhaenyra, the small folk and nobles alike dying in burning agony, and the war concluding with everyone losing and the sole survivor being a traumatised eleven-year-old, the message is clearer. War equals bad. Maybe a simple message, but then again, one that we're still struggling to get our collective heads round. I said I wouldn't write an English essay, and I have, so let's take the only reasonable course of action when you find yourself voluntarily doing English literature, and stop. Let me know all of my historical inaccuracies in the comments, and any other similarities to the anarchy I missed. Is Henry of Blah Laris strong? I didn't include that, but I did think it. Might do another video like this if I can think of any more historical parallels to cover. There's the War of the Roses, of course, but everyone talks about that, and I probably couldn't add much. Young Griff equals Lambert Simnel, anyone? Fagon will end up working in Stannis' kitchens? Or he could go later on, the Blackfires are the Jacobites, perhaps? Anyway, I'll save all that for later. For now, thanks for watching, and goodbye.